Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Adult Bible Study of the Center Ridge Bible Church for this morning. Um, keep in prayer this, uh, these studies because we keep on having the mix-ups and who's teaching and so I've had to fill in twice in a row. So uh, just pray that more people step up to the plate and help fill these gaps. So I really, you know, I just kind of threw this together. I hate to throw things together. But sometimes when you throw things together, they actually come out pretty good. Yeah. So uh, we'll see how the Lord leads this morning. We're going to uh, read in uh, James, the book of James, which I'm going to preach through soon. Uh, getting tired of doing topical studies. I think I'm going to do some ex, uh, expository teaching and preaching, which is taking a book and just going through it each week until you're done with it. Like we're doing on Sunday nights with uh, the evening service in Psalms. Okay, letter of James, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word, Lord. It's never dull, Lord. I don't know any book that you can just keep on reading it over and over again, and it's filled with life and wisdom. It is truly the living word of God. Uh, you just, it never ceases to amaze us of what it holds deep within the recesses of the pages and the letters. So we pray that thy Holy Spirit would just really uh, speak to who's ever listening and, and take this wherever you would. In Jesus' name, amen. So this, this morning's uh, title I threw together was called Bending Steel. And at the end of this message, I want you guys to be asking yourselves, uh, because in case you don't know it, you're being bent every day. And you have to ask yourself, who is doing the bending, God or Satan? Uh, because if it's God, it's a good thing. Because God needs to bend us. Sometimes bend us down to the ground. And, and we're going to, it's kind of, I didn't plan it this way. Hopefully God did. But this morning's message, this evening service message, uh, they're all going to have the same theme. And um, so that's the title. And before we get to James, uh, you know, I speak a lot about this book. This is The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee. Uh, I can't say enough about this book. And I, and I really don't recommend it to many people unless you are really, really mega sharp. Because I've been reading this book, I don't know, like seven years. And I'm finally down to that much. Because you could only read like one page a day. Because uh, you have to sit back and go, oh, man, I'm like this. i got to ponder this. It has got to be the heaviest, deepest thing I've ever, ever read. But I tell you, it is mind-blowing. And always remember, now this book, The Spiritual Man, I've, I've, I have a whole bunch of Watchmen Nee's book. This is a compilation of many of his books, many of them written in his 27 years in a Chinese prison for the gospel, where he died. You know, you listen to the words of a man who's in prison, married man for 27 years, uh, and he's going to walk close with God. You want to hear what he has to say. Matter of fact, I would advise you guys, in your life, you know what? If you look up to Christians, look up to Christians who have the hardest life. Yeah. Not the ones with the easiest life. Because the ones with the easiest life have very little to show for it. But those who have gone to the valley of the valley of the shadow of death, they they gain more. I mean, you you really have to go through darkness to understand the light. Uh, that's where God is found. Uh, he's found in the depths of a of an aching, searching soul. Uh, you know you you talk about people like you know Spurgeon and a lot of these great. Uh, theologians of times gone by, they suffered with depression, uh, loneliness, uh, just spending time alone with God. Uh, A.W. Tozer, 
uh, another one of my favorite greats. Uh, you know, people didn't want to hang out with him because he was just so deep and heavy. And uh, it was like, oh man, Tozer, what, are, what doesn't he stop, you know? But uh, you look at people in the Bible, you look at the Apostle John, you know, he wrote probably one of the best books in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Yep. How did he write it? In jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he ended up in jail, okay, for the gospel. All the other apostles have died. Talk about a lonely guy. And what's significant about the apostle John? Anybody? The one that Jesus loved. God has favorites. He really does. He, he loves us all equally, but what, what did you say? I said, yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would like to think it's me. I don't know. Uh, oh, I know. But, but it's uh, David. God loved David special. He had a special relationship. Moses, obviously. Uh, and definitely John. And uh, why? And you would think, wow, I'm God's favorite uh, well, what ended up happening to John? Gee, um, everyone's dead, all killed for the gospel, and I'm alone, and this is how I end up in prison? But God never forgets, right? And to those who get the greatest pain, get the greatest revelation. Okay, so never feel like, well, I'm alone in this pain and this suffering. What's the purpose? There is great purpose. Matter of fact, there is, is more purpose there because, I mean, we could all attest, you do not learn much in good times. You just don't, okay? I've had good times. I've had fun times. Even as a Christian, I tend to drift away from God when everything is, you know, just coming up roses and going, and going green because I start to think how great I am. And, uh, you know, and how much I deserve this. And I tell you, you want to walk with God, you know, I told you guys, what's that, what's that prayer? See how many people pay attention to what I say. I, I told you years ago, there's a prayer that you shouldn't pray unless you really want it. Anybody remember what that prayer is? Do what, do you, do what you want to do would make me who I should be. That's it. That's it, Thomas. And I remember a missionary coming up to me that stayed at our house and told me about that. And they said, but don't pray it because you will unlock, okay, a monster of situations. So I thought about that because I, I really did want, God, I want to be who you want me to be. But the missionary, I think it was uh, Carrie and Cynthia Buttram. Uh, that we used to support and uh, and I remember thinking about praying it and going oh I'm afraid because they told me what you do when you do that is you say okay God get me out on the operating table roll up your sleeves right and do whatever you have to do to make me what you want me to be and that means I give to you my loved ones my money my children, my wife, my possessions, my job, my everything. It's all yours. Do with it if you have to take it. And I remember that being introduced to me and going, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. So I, I really toyed with it because I really wanted that relationship. I toyed with it for a year. For some reason, a year sticks to my head. And one day I said, you know what? I think I'm going to say that prayer, you know? And I tell you, almost instantly, within a very short time, things didn't get better. Yeah. Things yeah. got worse. Worse than, I you know, that's when I got into, I fell into deep depression, suicidal thoughts, panic attacks. I mean, suicide notes. I mean, it was dark battle because I had everything, you know, because I, I figured, how far can you go? Because I, at that point, you know, I was coming to this church. I was a deacon here at this church. And, uh, and I was like, I was bored with how far I came in Christ. It's like, okay, so this is it. 
you know, I have everything that I have. You know, I had a great job. I made tons of money, kids, everything, a nice little house, community we lived in. Everything was perfect. I had everything I could ever dream. I had the, the job of my dreams. I was like, wow, life, I can't believe life is so good. No matter what I do, it just favor comes, favor, favor. And I was like, and I started to think, I think I got this God thing figured out. I think I got him figured out. And if I just give enough money, and I gave, me and my wife, we've always been big givers. We give enough money to the church. I gave more, kept giving more. And more money came in, and I kept, you know, getting more involved in church. And things, I mean, at work, I was just elevated, and positions came. I was like, wow. But you know what's interesting? I began to be discouraged with everything. I have everything. Because you get to have a point where you sit there and you go, well, what else more could I get? There's nothing else. And not that I was a celebrity, but you can understand how celebrities fall into depression because what happens when you, because all of us, we all have cheap as if I had a million dollars, I would get this, 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 I would move there, do that. Well, what happens after you do all that? Yeah. And you sit there on your front porch and you look and you realize, I'm not happy. Yeah. Vanity, vanity. That's scary. That's very scary. And that's what happened to me. I became miserable with everything. There's nothing else. I said, well, this is a problem now. I had a Jeep that I was building. I always had a Jeep that I was doing. And I had it all. And God, you know what God did? He didn't take that away. Matter of fact, he gave me more than I asked for. I was overflowing with favor and prosperity. God actually said, you I'm going to do something interesting with you. So I have, I have an odd story because I'm going to give you everything you want to show you it's not really what you need. And it's not a good deal to me. It was worked out fine. Going on vacations, meeting important people. I was just really, really, really good. But what happens when God says, I'm not going to take away the stuff. I'm going to take away the enjoyment of it. It's not going to be good anymore. That was really set me into one of the darkest, darkest places. And that's why it's hard to explain to people. Why are you depressed for? What's wrong with you? You've got everything. Your life is perfect. The kids were doing great. Everything was perfect. And people say, oh, you're just, you know, whatever. They just, they couldn't understand. But I want what you have. I'm envious of what you have. I said, but I'm miserable. I am utterly miserable. And that's, you know, and that's where that prayer came in and God started to pound me and really show me like Moses, you know, Moses left, you read this in, in Hebrews, I think 11, the pleasures of Egypt mm -hmm. to suffer with the people of God. Of course, he saw, he saw what was better. He didn't look at, well, you know, some, I was just talking to someone and they're, oh, it was my doctor. Uh, whenever I go to my general practitioner, he always has Bible questions and we always talk about politics and stuff. And he was asking me about Moses. Are there any, um, uh, you know, statues or things of Moses in Egypt? Because we have all the Sphinx and the pictures of, you know, all the pharaohs. Okay, because you would think Moses, if he was such an integral part of Egypt, and he, if Moses would have chosen, and that's another, if you don't think you can choose, Moses chose to step away. But he could have been Pharaoh. There should have been things of him built, obelisks, and all those things of the, of the likeness of Moses. But what did the Pharaoh say when Moses betrayed, killed an Egyptian, he goes, the name of Moses will not be mentioned. I want it slashed from every, every engraving, everything. I want it gone. No one will ever remember Moses. And Moses ends up in his wilderness experience from king kind of to pauper. And where does he you know, find himself 
looking up and hearing this voice, Moses, come talk to me. I got something for you. So, you know, so many people want the big, you know, and everyone thinks that, you know, a Christian who's really on fire for the Lord is someone at church every Sunday dancing around and waving their hands, praise the Lord, and they can't get enough of worship, worship, worship. Well, it means nothing. It's all a big show, people. Because you see those people on Monday, okay? And, I mean, you're not going to learn anything, really, very little from people like that because they're babes. They're very immature. And if they're not, you know, tickled and have lollipops thrown at them, they, they fold. They can't make it. They need good news constantly or they crumble. But you find someone who's gone through loss and pain and sorrow, and they still serve God, you want to hang out with that brother or sister. You want to talk to them and tell them and ask them, how did you do it? How did you do it? In James <coughs> chapter 1, uh, we'll start off in verse 2. Well, we'll start off back in verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God. Notice the first thing, a servant of who? God. And what? A servant, not a king, a servant. If you can't get in your head that you're here, <laughs> because I mean, what's today's, in, day, in today's vernacular in the modern church, it is that God is our servant, okay? God is here just for you, and every day, He's like, how can I just make you happy, you poor thing? I just, what can I do? And we, we sit there, God, I demand this, and I demand this, and okay, my child. And that God is a celestial servant to us, okay? That's a dangerous, slippery slope because James knew. The first thing he says, as he describes himself, James. And if you're interested, you know, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, the writers of it, notice when they start, they introduce themselves. And you know, like today when we write a letter, we end it with so-and-so, your name and yours. Back then, the way you did something is you signed what you read, what you, what you wrote in the beginning. Okay, and that's why these always start like this. And the first thing James says, James, and this is James speaking about himself, James a servant of God. Let's get that out of the way, right away. That's who I am. And of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Wow, that, that's, it's completely mm -hmm. anathema to anything in our psyche. Count it all joy when you fall inside the world, I, that doesn't sound like joy to me. And believe me, when I was going through that darkness, and I still do, I think if people, the only thing that keeps me close to God, and that might sound strange, is personal darkness. It's the only thing there. Dear Pastor, you don't really see it happy and up because you know what? You know, what? don't you have the joy of the Lord? Joy, joy, Dion. Remember that song? I've yeah. got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Right? You know, right? Where down in my heart? You know, you become very serious, and it's it's hard to be just, you know, Yahoo, because everything is very serious in life. It isn't a joke. It isn't one big game, okay? And I find myself, you know what? If God's going to get anything out of me, it's through bending steel, because our wills are like steel. And if anything is keeping you from God, it's you. It's your desires, your joys, your wants, your wills. And, you know, recently I've been having this battle, especially when I was sick. Man, I really, you know, God doesn't waste anything. And, you know, and you've heard me talk about this many times. And I keep going back and forth and back and forth. But the more I listen to God, he tells me over and over again, he goes, I know what you want, Scott. Do you know what I want? And I know what God wants. And then when it comes to doing this and being pastor, and 
I've always told you guys, you know how you can know the will of God in your life? Remember, who pays attention to that? How do you know what really God wants you to do? When it's not what you want to do. Because, uh, you know, I know what I want to do, and I can convince myself that's what God wants me to do. But as much as I retort with the idea of retiring and doing this and go, you know what God keeps telling me? You're not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, man. I got to, and, and no insult to you guys. It has nothing to do with you guys. It's just human nature. You know, I'm tired, and I'm looking for an out to get out. I'm tired. And it's been a rough ministry, beaten up, man. I've been beaten up. You can ask anybody who's been part of this church, man. I've been slandered and ridiculed and, I mean, so many things. It's like, it's been a hard, hard ministry. Abandoned, tra you know, been betrayed by people. Like David said, the very people that I broke bread with at my table have become my worst enemies. People who say they're your friends really are not. And I was like, oh, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, no, but this is what I want. And what if you stay and you preach here till the day you die? What about that? And now sometimes God offers this like he did to Abraham with Isaac. Not because he might want you to do that, but he wants to know, would you? What if everything that you are planning on in your dreams never happens? You lose everything and all you have is this. Because if that makes you sad, then I never was your joy. The things that I gave you was your joy. And it's like, oh, God, don't let me, just stop it with this stuff. I don't want to hear it. It's too heavy. I don't want to think upon these things. No, because I've got this. I want to know. Make sure you listen tonight. Really important. I, have, I tell you, whenever I go through something really dark and I was sick with COVID, uh, Always something comes out of it because this morning's message and tonight's message, especially voices in your head. That's what the title is for tonight. You want to hear that because uh, it really. Online. What's that? It's online. Yeah, yeah, it's online. If you if you if you can't come, uh, man, I learn so much when I go through so much and those dark wrestlings with God, my will versus God's will, my will versus, no, God, I really love you. God says, really? I don't think you do. And matter of fact, I'm gonna talk about it tonight and give you away some, some information. You know what God taught me? I don't love God that much as I think I do, okay? You might say, oh, pastor, that's a horrible thing. How can you be a pastor and not love God more than everything in the world? So well, that's a good question because I thought the same thing. And then God proved to me, he goes, you don't love, you love me, but not more than A, B, C, and D. And it was clear, and I was like, wow, you're right. And I had to say, I don't love God as much as I should. You know what I love more? My happiness. I love my, so I was asking, so it's, well, well, God, well, what do I love more than you? It was easy, he goes, your happiness. That's your God. And those are hard things, people. And that's why we don't get many people who come to this church, because you guys don't like it. Well, those who, who come here must like it. But I tell you what I learned. I tell you I've been doing this. I've been a Christian since 1984-ish, 85. And, you know, this is who I am. And I can't be another type of pastor. Uh, I can only be this. And some people are like, I don't want to hear that much truth. Tell us about how life has been blessed. And Oh, it's been blessed. It's been great. I've been provided for, but not without darkness, mm -hmm. not without pain, not without bending steel. Because God is either going to bend you towards him or you're going to let Satan bend him, both bend you towards him. Okay, which is what? When you're bent towards Satan, you're bent away from God. And there are forces, opposing forces. What, what happens, you know, you, you guys all know, you guys, you know, if you take a piece of steel and you go back and forth like this, what happens? Breaks, breaks right in half. And that's what happens if you, you know, in your battle, if you don't stop it and say, I'm not going to be bent by Satan 
And I'm going to reach the point where God doesn't have to bend me anymore because he can break. But let's move on here. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into to diverse, many different types of temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Okay? So the first thing we learn there is that our faith is being tried. Our faith is on trial by God and Satan. I believe in God. I will stand for him. I will burn at a stake for him. You know what? I will never say, you know, and this one thing you'll know, you'll never hear me say. I will never say, I would do anything for God. No matter what persecution comes, I'll go to jail for him. I'll never say that because I'd like to think that I would, but I don't know if I would. You know, I always think if a shooter came in here and said, who denied Jesus Christ? I would, I would say, shoot me for the sake of the people here. I don't know. Maybe I'd be hiding underneath that pew. I don't know. I like to think I'd do the right thing. But I don't know. Remember, you know, the Bible says, do not make promises to God unless you're going to keep them. Because God will hold you to him. I am this, and I am that, and I will stand to the very end, blah, 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 blah. Yeah? Well, what happens when everything comes crumbling down, and it's really push comes to shove, and life really gets hard? Are you really going to say, Jesus is my everything? When we, let's say every neighbor on your block, you know, goes ballistic, like they probably are already, and... Uh, you know, and you're the only Christian on your block. Hey, you probably are already. <laughs> it's not too far off the beaten path. But what happens, like it happened in Nazi Germany, where all the people who weren't Jews were told, you've got to kill your neighbors and turn them in. Would you still have, you know, your flag out there and your Jesus stuff? Or, or would you start laying low? I'm going to unplug myself from God. Got to save my skin. Got to save my skin. So these are hard truths. We got to, God wants to, you know what? He already knows, but he wants you to know. Okay. But look at verse four. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. You know, I mean, there's so much here. Uh, it's not really hard, you know, to go, wow, wow, Pastor, it sounds like you prepared this. Really didn't. What you got to do is open up the Bible and start reading. The, 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 the scriptures speak for themselves. The sermons just come out. Uh, right there, let patience have a perfect work. What do we see there? Let. You have to decide. That's a volition of your mind that I am not going to let these things destroy me. I'm going to let them bend me towards God. Will you? You have to decide. Let patience have her perfect work. Meaning don't, you know, whatever has to be, Lord, whatever must be, don't hold anything back. Because I want to be who you want me to be. And that's another question. Do you want God to just take you to like level five? Because that's what's happening today. You know, we're, I, I was just talking to uh, our church lawyer last night, Ken Auerbach, real great brother. I had some legal questions. And, uh, uh, and he was sharing with me, because he's a great warrior for Christ. And, uh, you know, many people today, uh, Christians, I'm talking about Christians, they don't want to go any further with God. You know, they, you know, since, you know, the big C came in 2020, Christians changed. Mm -hmm. I know so many that just said, you know what? I'm just going to back away. I did the Jesus thing. I served for years. I painted this. I did that. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I am done. I, I, I know a lady who's a really, you know, mega Christian, but it's Pentecostal way out there. But you would think Pentecostals, boy, they're really going to be. You know what? I couldn't believe she said, you know, I, I, I found out, I, you know, is this lady still going to church? Nah, not anymore. I'm kind of done with the church thing. What? You're done with the church thing? You were over-the-top fanatical for years and years and years. Ah, not really anymore. 
you know what, I... I love Jesus. I'm saved. I did my time. It's, it's like, like going to church was like doing time in jail. I, I served my time. Been burnt, hurt, and, you know, just, I'm done. You know, I know where I stand with God. I don't need it anymore. And we can convince ourselves. And what did these last three years show us? You don't have to come to church. You can just go on with your life. And we got the perfect excuse. Isn't it great? I, isn't it great today you have a perfect excuse? If you don't want to go anywhere... I'm not feeling well. Stay home. Don't come. You know, I love it. If you get invited to something you don't want to go to, it, it's, it's the great excuse. I got this little cough thing. Uh, you know, please do not come to this event. We don't want you here. So I say, like, hey, this is pretty good. Works great for church, too. You know, a lot of germs there in church. I couldn't get sick. Uh, I'm just going to watch online. And we know that fell through the, you know, how many people are watching online. Very few, okay? But it's a great excuse. And I was talking, you know, to Ken, and we, you know, talking about these days in which we live, that Christians are just, you know what, falling to the wayside. And, and you know what the attitude is? You know what? At the end of the day, I've got to take care of number one. Boy, isn't that, how have we, we've taken the world's philosophy, because isn't that the world's philosophy? You take care of number one. Who's number one? You. What's God's philosophy? Take care of number one. Who's number one? God. So I'm done, God. I'm going to go where it's easier, where it's not so much. Because eh, you know what I've been, what I've done. I'm, I'm good to go. I'm one of your guys, man. Served for years and years. If you had a chance to listen to uh, Wednesday night's Bible study, I got a little crazy. Sometimes I get crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, we, we always hear that many are going to stand before the great white throne and they're going to tell Jesus, you know, all they did, you know, for God and everything. And Jesus is going to go, I don't even know who you are. Do you know how many pastors, elders, deacons, missionaries, churchgoers in this very church, I believe too, throughout the years, who are riding on, on ground that won't support them, and they will stand before the Lord. Can you imagine? I've taught Sunday school for 40 years at the Center Reach. Hey, Center Reach Bible Church, one of the good ones. <laughs> right, God? And can you imagine, is it possible that Jesus will say, I never knew you. Your heart was never with me. It was what you grew into. It was, it was just like belonging to some religion or some club. Wow. And we all said that night, wow. Is that possible? You think that's possible or is it possible? Is it impossible? Especially, let's take the Center Beach Bible Church. We, we, we pride ourselves on theology and doctrine and steadfastness. Go to where this church has been in existence for 57, uh, since 1957. It's a long time. Do you think everybody who was a part of this church is going to go to heaven? I guarantee you there'll be a lot less, a lot, who will not. Why? Because they said, hey, I served. I put that doorknob in. <laughs> you know, I guess that was the gospel. For thou, God so, you know, who, whoever puts enough doorknobs in churches and paints enough walls, you're in. You're in. That's a scary thought. That's why, what is the Bible constantly asking us? Where do we stand with God? Yeah, and yet you can't say, I was a part of the Center Beach Bible Church. Big deal! That means nothing means nothing. Verse 5. Oh, look back to verse 4. Let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect. Okay? What does that mean? Without sin? No. It means where God wants you to be. A mind that is tuned in to God. An entire wanting nothing. Entire. Complete. You see, I, I need something to complete me. What's that famous line from that movie? You yeah. complete me, right? 
You complete me. Are you complete? Do you feel complete? If the, you have everything, every dot is checked and every, you know, I is checked and T is crossed. God says, I promise to do that. But you've got to let me do what I have to do in your head. I got to get in your head and in your heart. And then it says, be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Meaning you are satisfied. And this is going to bring me, where's my little thing here from Watchman Nee? I handed these out a couple of months ago. Yeah. This is so, I, I use it as a bookmarker, and, and about once a month, I read it to myself again. And this is a quote from the spiritual man, Watchman Nee. And it really just, it's like, oh, man. Wow. So it's, what does it mean to bear the yoke of Jesus and find rest to your souls? And we've heard that. We got that sign somewhere, right? Come unto me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, and you'll find rest to your souls and all that and everything. And how many times did we say that? We don't really know. Well, I haven't found any rest. I haven't found any of that. Well, what does it mean? I'm just going to read this. The Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples, saying, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Now, I'll tell you, I've been reading that scripture for years. And you ever just read a scripture and go, yeah, that's great. But you never really dig into it. You don't know what it means. And I didn't know what it meant. I thought I did. And I'm going to read it. The soul here alludes especially to the emotional part of our being. The Lord knows that his own people must pass through many trials and that the Heavenly Father is going to arrange them for them to be lonely and misunderstood. God is going to, because if everyone loves you and everyone wants to be around and you are the, and everybody talks about you, something is wrong. Because God, you look at, David, what made David, how did David get so close to God? He spent a lot of time alone, alone, betrayed, misunderstood. Did God allow that to happen? Absolutely. He probably orchestrated it. Because when everyone turns on you, what happens? You get closer and closer to God. Because he, and God says, am I enough? And deep in our hearts, the truth is we say, no, I want to be happy. As no one understands him except the Father, and no one will understand his disciples, verse 27. Jesus knows that the Heavenly Father must permit many unpleasant occurrences to befall the believers in order for them to be weaned from the world. People, if everything in the world massages your back and gives you joy. You need to be weaned because we need to get our comfort, our pleasure, our joy. And I'm not saying we can't have hobbies and go fishing and all that kind of stuff. And you can do all that. But what if it's all taken away? Do you crumble to the ground? Because it really separates the men from the boys. He also appreciates what the feelings in their souls will be like as they are put through the fire. For this reason, he tells them in advance to learn from him, learn from Jesus, so they might find rest from their emotions. People, our emotions, they're monsters. Our emotions, my emotions, have led me to so many bad decisions. Because we always say, you know, well, this is how I feel. Forget about, that's you know, one of the reasons why our whole world is collapsing, because we put feeling above fact. Well, I feel this about the situation. It doesn't matter what you feel, it matters what is. Well, I feel that one plus one should equal three today. That's what I feel. And, we, and everybody else agrees, oh, you could all agree on it. You could all feel wonderful about it. But it ain't right, it ain't the truth. You won't find rest until you find truth. I was talking to, been talking to this young lady who's struggling with her 
sexual preference and uh, looking for God and been going back and forth and and she tells me I just want to be happy and I found that this way of life is making it feels better than the other way but I just have no peace I just am miserable and I, and I told her we went back and forth and I gave her some stuff to listen to I said listen because I, I, I never judged someone to tell, I didn't want to focus on that I said I'm going to focus on that what you need to focus on, I said, you told me by your own admission, you have no peace. You just want joy. I said, truth is the only thing that'll bring you joy, that'll bring you peace. And obviously, what you're doing isn't working, is it? Why are you miserable if you say, well, this must be where I must be? Because it's not the truth. And I said, that's not something I have to tell you. You have to reach out. Because, and, that, and then she's been sending me all these things. She's watching about, I mean, I tell you, don't get your theology from Netflix. Mm -hmm. Because she's watching all, I, I watched this show, Pastor this guy, and it's, you know, talks a lot about God and Satan. And then she sends me these clips. And I, said, I said, you know, very interesting. It's, I'm glad you're looking for spiritual things. But you must look for truth, because all these things you keep sending me to justify, mm -hmm. justify how I'm feeling, they're not giving you any peace. You want them to, but they're not because deep in your soul, you know they're wrong. See, if there's no God, then I'm free to do what I want to do. But this person, I believe, because they're struggling, they want to know God. And pray for that young lady. And then we go through, what does it mean that Jesus is gentle? It means he is able to receive any treatment from men. He joyfully accepts the opposition of sinners. That has been the hardest part of being, if anybody wants to be a pastor or be in ministry, you have to get ready for opposition. You are going to be so unlike, well, unless you tell everybody whatever they want to hear then you'll be a star. But you are going to be opposed. Jesus was able to be opposed and still not be moved by it. He joyfully accepts the opposition of sinners. And we have to ask ourselves, can I accept anybody and whatever they do to me? Whatever they are, oh, I heard someone talking about you, Pastor. And this, it happens all the time. Boy, it tears me apart. Who's going to this church now? Who's going to that church? Who's sending their kids here, not sending them there? Tears me apart. And God says, you've got to be like Jesus. It can't affect you. Because it's not about you. It's about them and their relationship with God. You have to work on your relationship in God. And if everyone leaves and it's just you, you have to stick with being okay with it. Look at Jesus. Yet the ambitious are hurt. The ambitious are angry. The ambitious are restless when they cannot obtain their wishes. But Christ at all times lives gently and humbly on earth. There is consequently no occasion for his emotions to boil or erupt. He teaches that we should learn from him, that we should be gentle and lowly like he is. He says for us to bear his yoke as a restraint upon ourselves. He bears a yoke too, even the yoke of God. What was his yoke? I'm going to the cross and I will bear it joyfully. He is satisfied with his Father's will alone, meaning as long as the Father knows and understands, why should he be concerned about the opposition of others? As long as God knows the truth, we can all convince ourselves we're right, they're wrong, blah, blah, blah. God knows the truth, and we'll have to give an account for that. He is willing to accept restrictions given him by God, he explains that we must bear his yoke, accept his restraint, do his will, and see no freedom for the flesh. 
If this is done, then nothing can disturb or provoke our emotions. This is the cross. If anyone is willing to receive the cross of Christ and submit completely to the Lord, he shall find rest to his emotions. And isn't that the biggest thing, people? Man, if I could just get my emotions out of me and like just unplug them like a, like a circuit, I would be so much of a better person. But my, mo my emotions destroy me. There is none, excuse me, this is none other than the satisfied life. The Christian cherishes nothing but God. But when I, when I read these things, I'm like, wow, I don't, that's not me. I wish I could tell you. I only love God, and if my skin was ripped from my body, I would praise him. I, that's not me. I get a little hangnail, and I'm already complaining. Okay? The Christian cherishes nothing but God. Henceforth, he is satisfied with his will. Because if it's God's will, it can't be wrong. If it's from God, then I will joyfully accept it. God himself has filled his desire. He regards everything God has arranged or given, asked or charged him with as good. If he can but follow the will of God, his heart is satisfied. He seeks his own pleasure no longer. Oof, that's hard. And not because of force, but because God's will has satisfied him. I'm not there yet. It's like, well, Pastor, you sound so deep. Blah, blah, blah. It means nothing, guys. I'm not there yet. I don't think I'll ever be there. Since he is now filled, he has no more requests to make. A life such as this can be summoned up in one word, satisfied. Satisfied. Is anyone here, and no show of hands, are you totally satisfied with where you are in your life right now? Okay. The characteristic of spiritual life is satisfaction. You want to say, I'm a great Christian, I'm a good Christian. Well, then you should have a satisfied heart. Whether I'm up, whether I'm down, doesn't matter. God's in control. And if God is allowing it, then I am satisfied with it. Do you realize how that cuts us down? That bends our steel. The characteristics of spiritual life is satisfaction. Not in the sense of self-centeredness, self-sufficiency, your self-will, but in that of the person having found all his needs, all his needs fully met in God. To him, God's will is the very best. He is satisfied. What else does he need to ask for? This is gold, baby. I tell you, this is gold here. Watchman Nee, not that I believe everything he says and he is this infallible guy, but man, where did he learn that? In jail. Because if that guy could go 20... I tell you, after the first week, I would probably the first day, I'd be ticked off at God. The rest of my life, I'm going to spend in jail for being a preacher of righteousness. Never get to see my wife again. He never does. But he can write that. I am satisfied. How? How can you be satisfied with God? Because whatever God gives is good. And if this is my destiny then I'm okay with it. I'm satisfied. For this is where I will finish out my ministry. There, I will speak to the prison guards. There, I will reach out to the other prisoners. There, I will find my purpose like the Apostle John. So, heavy stuff, guys. Bending steel. Which way are you going to bend? And it's hard because it's much easier to bend to our will than God's. And, you know, I am thankful that God doesn't ask perfection in, in this life because I don't care who you are. There's no one on this planet who's ever going to reach it. But it doesn't mean you're not. Well, you can't reach it. So Pastor Scott said you can't reach it. So just settle. No, 
We're supposed to be every day acquiring more Christ-likeness. Never satisfied with where we were yesterday, but saying, God, no, I am not okay. How many people think I've learned enough about Jesus? I need to read no more. What can you teach me? And that's what I said Wednesday night. I lost my temper. How many people don't come anymore? Why? I don't need this. Uh, I got it all. There's nothing else to know. There's nothing else to know about the master of your DNA. You got to be kidding me. That doesn't entice you. You're not excited to know the mysteries of the year. Ah, yeah. I'm going to heaven when I die. Jesus loves me. I'm good to go. Okay. I don't see a passionate love relationship there. You know what God wants? Passionate love relationship. I don't know about, do you want a dead love relationship? Or do you want passion? Erica, do you want passion? I know you do. <laughs> you want passion. You deserve passion. Because when you're in a relationship with God, he doesn't want lukewarm, you know, well, how are you doing? You know, I'll talk to you next week. He wants intimacy. He wants passion. He wants a love like you've never seen before. All encompassing, enamored, with the totality of God himself. That's what God wants. Do I give that to God? Not even a speck. But he loves me. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why, but he loves you too. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this book, Lord, this the depth of your riches in Christ, Lord, that we have never even tapped into because we got so many other things on our mind, so many other better things to watch on Netflix, Lord, so many other times we can put our feet up on the couch. We've got our hands stamped. We're good to go. Yeah, and, and we could live like that and die and go to heaven. That's true. But boy, when it comes to the Bema seat and the rewards, imagine realizing you get nothing because you did nothing. You get to go to heaven. But God says, I don't really have much rewards for you because you served me mostly in the flesh. Lord, let us see the bigger picture and bend me to you. There are many forces bending me away. In Jesus' name, amen.